Hallelujah. Find an unfamiliar face and go over and shake their hand and welcome to Great Fellowship, if you would. Back in with the uh, chorus of that song. Oh, this one? Ready? One, uh, two, three, four. You are the everlasting God. blessing it is to be able to come into your presence at your invitation, <clears throat> Lord, to worship you. Lord, we can't do it in our own strength, so pour out your Holy Spirit, fill us afresh, that we might truly worship you in spirit and in truth. In your wonderful, precious name, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Hey, take a seat, take a look at the bulletin, and uh, see what is there. Kathy has a sign-up sheet, and she's going to be passing it around right now. Uh, Rock, go ahead, you, do you want to... Yeah, 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 why don't you come up here? Invite me over for dinner, and you'll be on the list of good cooks. <laughs> <laughs> so um, our sister Roxanne, otherwise known affectionately as Roxy, she usually sits in that second row about where Christy is now, smiling up at the people on the platform here. She's had a couple of surgeries in the last two weeks. And she's in the midst still of waiting for her vaccine to be effective. So um, we are setting up some um, some meals for her. And you know what? I forgot to put her space number. She lives over here in the um, Trails End RV park. It's just the first crossover um, by the Red House, crossing over the train track and go right. She's in number 30. And I'll write that on here. I've written her telephone number. And she's pretty much for another two weeks kind of housebound until her vaccine becomes more effective and she'll be starting radiation and chemo. So um, that's part of the reason that we wear masks here because there are some people more vulnerable than we are. And I appreciate all of the signs of love and care I see out there right now. So I'm gonna pass this. Her number is right next to Roxy Meals. So you can maybe call her the day before or the day of. Your conversation is as much food to the soul as your meal will be. All right, here. Yeah, absolutely. And she's generally asking for soup. Now, that might change by Tuesday or Wednesday. She might be all souped out. But... Uh, okay, great. Pra praise the Lord. Yeah, I encourage you to sign up and... and, uh, and uh, Help out, Roxy. Yeah, she's in good spirits. Uh, good, good, good stuff is happening there. Uh, hey, we're continuing uh, on the rule of life su Sunday evening um, tonight. The uh, I mean, the formal classical title is Lectio Divina, which is essentially reading the Bible to hear the living voice of God. So that that's going to be our uh, the, the next discipline that that we tackle. That's tonight at six. Uh, over here in our in a Bible study room. Uh, if you want to catch it on Zoom, we'll also be on Zoom. So you can uh, use this morning's invitation 
to do that. If I don't have your, if you did not get a morning invitation to worship Zoom invite, that means I don't have your email address. So you just got to let me know that you want to be included on the list and you'll get that every week. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, Candy? Come on, Candy, quickly. November the 3rd is International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Just wanted to remind you guys, okay? That's all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and we'll probably be focusing on Haiti, That, uh, but that, that continues to be a, just a tough, tough place with a well, failed state, gangs run, run, run in the country, and, you know, just a lot of missionaries in that Ireland nation, and just everybody's under threat. So just, just keep Haiti in mind. Anything else? Yeah, Terry. Morning. I just wanted to kind of recognize Chad. You know, Chad does a lot of things that I don't even notice until he points them out to me. But he does a real good job, and he's just faithful. And I just want to say, Chad, thanks. Hey. I didn't know his first name was Michael. Michael Chad Curry. Also, the uh, testimony at the Mormon Church is coming up in two weeks. So if you want to come, we still have a few seats available. And if you want to come and talk about your favorite subject, just see me. Okay, anything else? All right, hey, the, uh, the altar is open. And I encourage you to draw near, bend the knee in an act of uh, public submission and just uh, let us seek the Lord together. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. And kindle on us the fire of your love. I have decided
Hallelujah.
deserted or lonely I'm not disturbing Cause I'm heaven bound I'm just a pilgrim In search of a city Kids, come on up. Who's got it? Now this is what. Now this is one of my favorite scripture verses. And as the kids are coming, I forgot to announce that uh, uh, Brian Drucker is gathering folks uh, at the at City Park at one o'clock to, uh, to pray around life and the abortion issue. So that's at one o'clock. Looks like it's going to be a great day. Um, it was a little scary this morning, but it's warmed up. Um, Two brave souls. All right. Anybody got it? You guys didn't memorize one of my favorite Old Testament scripture verses? Well, this is how it goes. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And that's in my favorite minor prophet, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. So, Lord, I just thank you for the blessing. And as these guys go off to Children's Church, just go with them and encourage them. In Jesus' name, amen. And we're going to sing uh, hymn number 115, Fairest Lord Jesus.
Thank you, Lord. All right. Good morning. Is there a word from the Lord today? Al's not in town, so. Daryl, you come on up. As I was coming to church this morning, uh, the news I heard was probably in the ocean. That good? Daryl, anyone else? All the time. All right, Would you join me in prayer here as we get started. Lord, I, um, I thank you for the word you've given our brother Daryl here this morning. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just offer my own confession that it's easy to get bound up in the, uh, the problems of uh, my little life in this little town and this little state and this little country. And we're reminded, Lord, that the whole world is in your hands. Um, and we, uh, we try to look out with clear eyes at the trouble, the hurt, uh, the mourning that happens every day. And Lord, we ask that your power and your presence, and as, as we heard uh, those kids uh, learn that verse today, that not by might or strength, but by your spirit, Justice, mercy, uh, grace would be made real in the lives of those who desperately need you. So we pray by name for those in Afghanistan, uh, for those in Haiti, uh, for those who count yourselves as members of your church, and for those who do not yet know your name. Lord, um, make us lights in the darkness where we don't have strength or influence or power, let us immediately recognize that you always do. Let us turn to prayer and to trust you all the more with the ways of this world. But again, Lord, it is in your hands. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. All right, now I'm going to switch mics, Chad. You ready? Everything's about to happen. All right. Ooh, that's pretty loud. All right. Give me, give me just a second. You know, this is the diciest part of the day for me. Operating the technology. We're going to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting close. Bingo. All right. Um, how many of you here last week? Most of you? No, I shouldn't ask that question. I, was I take that back. You're never supposed to ask that. Why did I do that? Rookie move. Um, hey, if you weren't here last week, or if you were, we started a new sermon series called Foundation, uh, Fissures into Foundation. Uh, we are kind of taking a look 
at some of the challenges that are facing the church, the culture, um, our very lives at this moment. Um, Kyle started with the image of that uh, seaside condominium collapse, right? Um, which we know, um, you know, th this, this, this terrible tragedy that befell folks in the middle of the night, but it started with one little leaky pipe that uh, compromised the strength of one small pillar in a subterranean garage, and it caused this entire building to collapse. And, uh, we know many lives were lost. And so it, it provides just an image, a picture of kind of what we want to do is, is we look at um, uh, some collapse around us, right? Some failure around us. And, and we don't want to dwell on it. Uh, we don't want to uh, uh, veer towards a cynicism or pessimism, but we do want to understand it. Uh, we want to look at it faithfully and biblically, and, and we want to see what our Lord is doing in the midst of it. And, uh, and so we continue the series, and uh, the, the focus today is uh, on something that I hope I can articulate well here today, but I got plenty of Bible verses just in case I can't, so um, you can pay attention to those slides and ignore mine if that helps out. But we're going to be talking about religion without relationship and the difference between those two things, and specifically we're going to slice in here with Matthew 26, 1 through 5. So let's start, as we should, with the Scripture. Um, and as we do, I, I want you to try to listen for two distinct voices that are at work in this passage, one right after the other, okay? So here it is. When Jesus had finished all these things, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priest and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. What we have here is this two, two ideologies, right? Two personalities, two voices, two types of authority set right beside one another. We have that of Caiaphas, the high priest, and that of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And so I, I think it's important just so we kind of recognize some of the attributes of each, all right? So what do we see in Caiaphas? I think for me, the most obvious is that Caiaphas is clutching and grabbing for power, right? He recognizes that Jesus has come into town. He seems to have a pretty excited following. Anything I should do about this, Chad? Just keep going. All right. Um, and, and, and on the opposite side, we see Jesus, right, who is, who is speaking to his disciples of his sacrifice that is soon to follow. In other words, we have one a type of authority that is clutching for power, and we have another type of authority that's preparing for sacrifice. We, we can hear in Caiaphas this idea of self-protection, right? He knows that, that, that the power, the privilege, the esteem he's been given right now, and he's looking to hang on to that. Jesus, just the opposite, preparing both himself and others for this idea of self-surrender. He, he's going to let go of the worldly power or the influence or whatever esteem he may have gained. I, th I think there's uh, particular things that, to, to notice in the language. You know, when we talked about Caiaphas. It says that he and the other chief priests plotted by stealth, right? It was done in secret. It was done at night. It was done in the dark. Jesus speaks to his disciples plainly tells them exactly what's going to happen. We see throughout the Gospels, they don't quite pick up on it because they're still surprised when the cross comes. But Jesus never kept it a secret. He speaks plainly. Uh, on a really direct level, right, Caiaphas is planning and plotting to take a life. What is Jesus' aim and goal? To give life. Doesn't get much more clear than that, right? If, if, if you understand the temple system and what sustained it, and this is why Jesus went in in the days before and cleansed the temple, and he flipped over the money changers' tables, and specifically, he went after those that sold doves. If you listen to the podcast as we Kyle unpacked that for us, doves were the offering that were sold to the poorest of the poor, who couldn't afford a lamb to bring to the altar. And so the selling of doves what was the, the trampling on of the most in need, the most vulnerable. And you can see why that got Jesus's attention, right? 
So the, te the temple system, if we look at, at what Caiaphas and the other high priests were maintaining, was a, a system that oppressed. And compare and contrast that with the ministry of Jesus, which empowered. Think of those that Jesus met, right? He lifted them up. He gave them dignity and strength. He reminded them that they were made in the image of God. He healed. Very different. In Caiaphas, we see that his power came of Rome, right? He was, he was installed. He was propped up by the Roman powers that be. And, and his power was toward Rome, right? He, he got it from him, and he knew he had to, to play along with him, or else it would evaporate. Where's Jesus' power come from? It's of his father. It's of God. And it returns towards God, right? Towards God's glory. Different source, different objective in both cases. I think we also see that in Caiaphas, there, there's, there's a focus on an institution. And most of us work for or take part in an institution, right? And, and maybe that's where our job is and that's where our paycheck comes from. But it's not our identity. It's not our worth. And it's, it's not our goal. Caiaphas is trying to uphold an institution Jesus is advancing a kingdom, a whole new way of being. There's a vast difference between them. So maybe the simpler way to say it is that, that we see Caiaphas is clearly invested in the ways of the world in, in, in earth, right? And Jesus is aimed squarely at heaven. And not just aimed at squarely, because we've talked about this a lot, but Jesus has brought heaven with him, right? And he's showing his disciples and he's showing us what it means to be forebears, to, to bring heaven to earth. And, and if we, we had to add all this up, I think what we see in Caiaphas is he is, is a type of authority that maintains religion, right? He remain, maintains a system. It's hierarchical. There are those in power. There are those who aren't. There's rules. There's, there's things that can't be broken. And what we see in Jesus is a relationship. His relationship to the Father, his relationship to us, the, the community of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? That this community, this relationship of love that we are bound up in now as his disciples, as his followers. So are you with me so far? Do we see just a, a vast difference in the type of authority? Awesome. All right. So we have these two voices. And I, and I think the question we're, we're thinking about is, in, in a world full of voices ourselves, who do we listen to? That's, that's kind of the central question today. So let, let's be super clear about this. Deuteronomy 18.15 spells it out pretty, pretty uh, nicely. for us. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. This is an Old Testament prophetic word pointing to Jesus. Think, who are you going to listen to? We're going to, we're going to listen to him. So just in case anyone was, you know, two slides behind, when it comes to Caiaphas or Jesus, we're listening to Jesus, right? Amen. All right. But, but let's, just, let's be honest. This is a scary slide. Uh, just be honest that... that Although that sounds simple, Deuteronomy 18.15 makes it really clear, right? We're going we're gonna to listen to this one voice, we're going to listen to him. We know that we just live in a world full of voices. And so I just want to name some of those tensions, some of those, those things that pull for our attention, right? And, and these stood out to me, and there might be others that stand out to you. Did I mention that the, the scriptures are in the blue slides and these tan slides are more my thoughts? So if you only remember half of them, remember the ones in blue, all right? But it occurs to me that right now, we're, we're, when we think about this idea of fissures in the foundation, we see a real difference between a party, like a political party we belong to, and the body of Christ. I just see a, a, a tearing of the fabric in those two things. That, that's heartbreaking, Right. I, I see a difference between our ideology, those ideals that we hang on to, versus a community. A community draws people together who might have very different ideas. Let me point to something a little specific. There's, there's Facebook, where we can go and get spun up on all kinds of things. And there's faithful friends. 
And just in case you think I'm pointing the finger at any of you, I'm really just preaching to myself here with this slide because these are the things that vie for my attention, right? And, and I can just tell a visceral difference from the, the, the time I'm scrolling online to the time I'm sitting down at dinner with friends. One leaves me anxious. One leaves me angry, pumped up. The other, I'm at peace. I'm at rest. I know I got folks that love me that may not understand me, but they still love me, you know, which is really sweet. Um, other tensions, pundits and pastors, right? We have a world full of podcasts and news shows and columnists and opinion writers and all that. And, and I'm a news junkie. I'm just going to be honest. I love it. And I have my favorites. And if you ever want to talk about them, I'll tell you who they are. But I have to be very mindful that I, that I can begin to lean towards my pundits and, and forget who my pastors are, right? And notice I put that in plural. Because as a kingdom of believers, as a, as a nation of priests, we're all called to be pastors, actually, right? So that, that doesn't just point to, to one person. Um, this, this occurred to me this week as I was thinking about this. Um, we see a lot, in, I think, in the church right now of those who are gathering because they are like-minded. And that sounds really good, right, to surround yourselves with like-minded individuals. In a sense, that's right. But I think what we're seeing in, in, the, in this world full of turbulence and churning and all that is that guess what? When the next election cycle arrives or the next pandemic arrives or the next government mandate arrives, those of us who are like-minded here might find ourselves in a month or two not being so like-minded. And what do we do? Do we reshuffle? Do we separate? Do we find a new place to be again? Or do we recognize that we are like-hearted? We are like-hearted, that we have a heart that is humble and reverent before Christ. Because that bond will last. Like-mindedness will shift and change a hundred times. And we've seen that over the last year or two, have we not? Just another kind of thought to think about. Um, and most of us have this device in our pocket right now. I, I left mine a whole eight feet away right now. But we have this thing in, in, in our lives, this phone, right, that knows us sadly better than we know ourselves, which should just not be the case, right? So when I Google something, there's an algorithm there that already knows what I want to see. And so if I'm for something, it's going to pop up three articles that are for something. And if I'm against something, it's going to pop up three articles that are against something. That, that phone that I think is, is, is a way for me to study the world is actually studying me, right? And if you've, you, I mean, you, you can name the app, but they, they get to know you pretty well. I used to think I had really good taste in music. Now I have this thing called Spotify that picks all my songs for me. And I, you know, and I rejoice when it picks a song that I don't like, because I think, see, you don't have me yet. But you know, then I put a thumbs down and it knows me that much better. And it, you know, it hasn't picked a song I don't like in months. But but what stands on the opposite side of algorithms, right? Are are playing into this machine that gets to know us and feeds us those things which confirm what we already think. It is an act of intention, where we set that thing down, where we walk away, where, where before we go down the line on what it's told us, maybe we submit that to prayer, we submit that to silence, we submit that to the community. Another way to think about this, there's just a drift in culture, right? There, and this is nothing new, although I'm giving some kind of contemporary examples. The world runs one way, and disciples need to develop disciplines that will help us walk in another way in an entirely different way. And so again, what, what am I kind of talking about and all this say? There's, all of us, whether we consider ourselves religious or not, are religious people. We're religious beings because we invest our time, our talent and energy in that which we think is important. Whether you name a God or not, we are all religious in that way. But what, what we're being called into is a relationship, a relationship where, where we here, where we listen, where we respond, where we shema with our creator. That's, that's what we're being called into.
Amen. Now, just, just to make this crystal clear one more time, the voice we're listening to, Luke 9, 35, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. All right, we, are we keeping the, the target clear here? Okay. Um, I want to say this. Uh, listening is more than simply hearing. It, it is that deep calling on our lives that, that speaks to our deepest longing to deep relationship with him. This, this is that link between listening and, and, and relationship, right? Because what, what does it take to listen? Well, one, you have to stop yourself from talking. I remember our, our first year of marriage. And, you know, and Heather would say, you know why you don't hear me? And I'd say, I, I was just talking, so I actually didn't hear her, right? You have to stop talking. You have to stop talking to hear. And then, you know, we practiced that a little bit. And then we'd, we'd go to a friend's house, we'd visit, and she'd say, how many questions did you ask? You know, and I'd say, not one. You know, so it was like the, this, this process, right? You know, I'd go to, I'm going to ask three questions. You know, and I'd get out of the dinner party we were in, I'd say, ask three questions tonight. You got, you got to listen, right? In order to be in relationship, you have to slow yourself. You have to pay attention. And so, and so for any relationship, whether, whether it's with others or, or a spiritual relationship with the Lord, we have to pause. We have to listen. We have to hear and we have to respond. Again, just this idea that, that, that this, this is so rooted in us, it's so deep. Psalm 42, 7, deep calls of teeth at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song was with me, a prayer to God of my life. Again, this, this call on our life to listen is, is really a call to that deepest desire that we have to, to know and be known by our creator, and to be loved by him. I, I want to kind of pause and say a word, and again, maybe all these tan slides are me just talking to myself, um, but, but in this time of tension, I think it's really important that we recognize, or at least I'll recognize, my inclination to harden my heart, right, towards those who I disagree with, to those who seem to be leaning a different way at this time. And what I, what I want to remind myself and of you is that there is an enemy behind our enemy, okay? And we, we are not embattled with our brothers, especially our brothers and sisters within our church, and we're not embattled with those outside of the church. We should be reaching out to share the gospel with those outside the church, right, to demonstrate our love and our care to them, the same love and care and grace and mercy that's been poured out on our lives, right? And they are not an enemy, but we recognize there is an enemy that stands behind them who is rejoicing when he sees us fall apart, when he sees us divided, when he sees us angry with one another. It's a feather in his cap. Is that right? Just remember, Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So I'm not going to look at my brother and go, you. I'm going to look at my brother with love, and I'm going to recognize that there's an enemy that stands behind me that would like me to be angry with my brother. And I'm going to say, you. In the name of Jesus, flee. Yes? Amen. All right. So um, what have I done here? I've just made a, a, a big mess, right? There's voices. We see them in this passage uh, in um, Mark, and, and, and then we see them at work in the world, and we want clarity as to the voices we want to listen to. We want to make sure we have a soft heart a, a, as we engage these problems with our brothers. Um, and, and, and I think to better understand kind of our contemporary context, which is, is, you know, what we're focusing on this topical sermon series for the next week's week, we really just need to expand our biblical context, 
Okay, that's, that's where we're going to go for the clarification for the answer. And so here's, here's how we're going to divvy this up. I just gave you Mark 26, 1 through 5. So next, we're going to go to the passage that comes right before it. And then after that, we're going to go to the passage that comes right after it. And then after that, we're going to go way back to the beginning of the book, Genesis 1 and 2. And then we're going to go all the way to the end of the book, Revelation. All right? So we're just going to keep expanding that biblical context. Are you with me? Okay. Cool. So we're Mark. Uh, Ma excuse me. I say Mark. Matthew. I'm Matthew. I should remember this. Uh, we, we were in Mark or Matthew 26. Let's, let's back up just one passage before. And again, what we're, what we're trying to discern here is the type of voice, the type of authority we want to listen to, that which we want to be in relationship with. So this is a passage that precedes the one where we saw the difference between Jesus and Caiaphas. It's a little long. It's okay. It's the Bible. It's good for you. Here we go. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. This is Jesus talking, by the way. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from another as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now pay attention here. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe thee? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Is that passage not clarifying in the type of voice and the type of authority we ought to be paying attention to? There's a lot we could say about this. There's a ton we could unpack here, but I'm just going to keep it real simple. Jesus and his people are humble and helpful. I, I hear that in that scripture. I hope you do as well. Again, there's a lot more we could say, but I'm a simple guy, so I'm going to keep it simple. Jesus' people are humble and helpful. And I'll just contrast that with other voices that we're hearing in the world that are not so humble and not so helpful. Let us learn to recognize the difference. Okay? That's the passage that came right before Matthew 26, 1 through 5. Let's take a look at the one that comes right after. 26, 6 through 13. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of the Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. She poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the di disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For we will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. You hear it? Again, let's think about the, the attributes, the type of person Jesus is, the type of person who follows Jesus. Jesus and his people are holy and honoring, holy in that term of being set apart, right? They're not just looking at the world through utilitarian lenses for what can get done, what's practical, what, what makes the most sense for myself and maybe others, right? They're holy. They recognize the holiness of Jesus, just as this woman did with her alabaster flask. Here he is, and she honors him. And again, we just contrast this with the voices in the world. Are they holy? Have they set themselves apart? Have they set Jesus apart from all else? And are they honoring him? The type of voice, the type of authority we want to listen to. Now we're jumping all the way back, all the way back to the beginning. Remember, so we're just going to keep moving the, the bookmarks out. So up at the start of the book, Genesis 1, 27, and then Genesis 2, 7. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. 
You were made by him in his image. And if that weren't powerful enough, hear the intimacy of that in Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Pause for a second. Breathe through your nose. Exhale through your mouth. The breath of life. Breath of God with us, in us, sustaining us. That's who we are. And again, we we need to grab a hold of this, that we are made in his image. As we've talked about many times in this church, that we are not merely human, as Paul reminds us, right? And yet we are not haughty. I want want us to, to zero in on that. We, it, is, it is absolutely essential. We understand that, that, that God stamps himself on us, made in his image. That's powerful. Not only that, he gives us dominion. He says, be fruitful and, empower, and, and multiply. He empowers us to, to rule rightly over creation. And that's not to abuse it and take what we want for it. It's, it's, it's to care for, to curate, to, to steward well creation. And we are not merely human. We're not these material objects that are going to live a few years and then pass away and become earth again, right? We're we're spiritual beings embodied in flesh that will be resurrected again as we've seen in Christ. And yet, we are not haughty because we recognize we are a creature with a creator. And we need to think about that rightly. Here's some verses that will help. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, you know, this is kind of a Sunday school answer, but if you're looking for an example of how we ought to pull some of these things off, how do we strike this balance? Jesus is a pretty good example, usually. Um, Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And this psalm, which has just been resonating with me lately, Psalm 31. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. We're surrounded by great matters and things perhaps a little bit too wonderful for us. Listen to this. But I have calmed and quieted myself, and I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. Church, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Do we see that posture made in his image, not merely human, and yet not haughty? That's the beginning of the book. Let's go to the end of the book, okay? This is, this is, this is a story that we've got to hold in mind. Because these are anxious days. These are stressful days. These are unsettled days. And guess what? We've been told that from the beginning, that's exactly what we can expect. But these aren't the end of days. This is what that sounds like. Then the angel showed me a river of water of life, being as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree or for the healing of the nations. That goes our prayer from this morning. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is the story. This is what we're rooted in. 
and everything that swirls around us right now is a very little consequence when we know that this is where we're headed. And so this is the baseline. Again, there's a ton we could unpack here, but let us not forget this. Jesus and his people are hopeful because we know how the story ends. And the story doesn't end, actually, does it? It goes on forever and ever in a place where he is the light of the day and there is no night. So let's add this all up if we can. Jesus and his people are humble and helpful. Again, I'm, I'm kind of putting the cookies down on the bottom shelf, but we're in this, we're in this battle, right? Where we're trying to discern who to listen to and what to listen to and who to put in authority over our lives. Jesus and his people are humble and helpful. Let's just use that as a marker. His, his people are holy and honoring. They set him apart. They set themselves apart and they honor the Lord. They recognize that they're made in his image. They're not merely human and yet they are not haughty. Did I mention I'm pre preaching to myself this morning? And ultimately, in a world full of anxiety and anger and division and fear, Jesus and his people are hopeful. Jesus and his people are hopeful. Can we agree on that? Amen. I don't hear kids out there yet. Let, let me, let me kind of zero this in just a little bit. Again, voice we're listening to. Who, who, who ought to we be listening to? I'm just, I'm just going to uh, use Kyle's definition of what an elder is. Uh, old wise ones. Old wise ones, right? Proven listeners. And notice, notice I put that word in quotation because a lot of us listen well to the world. I'm a good listener. I listen to podcasts. I listen to newspaper articles. I listen to Netflix. I li I'm always listening, right? But am I listening to the word of the Lord? And am I surrounding myself to people who are listening to the Lord? People with some biblical depth, right? People have spent some time in the word, studying, understanding, digging a little bit deeper. People with a grasp of tradition um, who understand, you know, th this has happened before. I listened to a, a great podcast this week by a guy named Ed Stetzer, who's a theologian and a missiologist and three PhDs and all this stuff. But he was talking about that there's this convulsion that happens in culture about every 60 years. And he's talking about the late 1960s, where the culture was incredibly divided over the Vietnam War. And there were people that were patriots and there were people that were uh, draft dodgers and, 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 and people were lining up on both sides, right? And he mentioned there was a thing, which I guess you could get away with saying this at the time, was a pandemic called the Hong Kong flu. And instead of face masks and lockdowns, they threw Woodstock and then they all drove to Heat Ashbury so they could get it all the way across the country. But anyway, like in the midst of that, the Jesus movement broke out and thousands came to know the Lord. Well, that, that's helpful to grasp that little tradition, that history of the church and go, hey, we've seen this type of thing before. And guess what? God is on the throne, his work advances, and the gospel will be heard. It's helpful for me to hear those voices. It's hopeful. We also just want to listen to people with proven character. And proven character takes some time. It just takes some time. And this is the, 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 a critical piece folks with the validation of a community. There's lots of lone wolves out right, right now shooting off their opinion. Who knows them? Who can speak into their lives? Who holds them accountable? We should pay attention to that. All right. I got one spiritual discipline and one way to practice this. Let me, I guess I should do this. Um, we must attune our souls to recognize, to discern, to hear and respond, to shema. We've heard that word, right? Sometimes it's translated hear, O Israel. Sometimes it's translated obey, O Israel. And the truth is, which one is it, hear or obey? Yes. Yes, both and, right? We just don't have the right word for it. But we hear and respond to that type of voice, to his voice. And in that, again, we're invited into that relationship with Christ. All right. So I'll end with a story which kind of also illustrates a practice that we might uh, fall into. Um, and that is the idea of centering prayer, right? A centering prayer is not so much a prayer where we speak or we offer 
um, request to the Lord, a thanksgiving to the Lord, it's really where we still ourselves and we listen to the Lord. Now, I'll tell you, a few weeks ago, I was at Arizona at a spiritual direction retreat, and they gave us time to do this. And it was incredibly easy, right? And it was, it was beautiful. It was a gift. And, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, of course, I can do this in Arizona, a thousand miles away from my kids and my job and all the other things that will distract me. What's going to happen when I get back home? Well, the Lord, Lord, you know, don't ask the Lord to, don't challenge him because he'll call your bluff, I guess is the lesson. Um, so this week I've been having some weird neck things going on. So I had to have an MRI. Anybody had an MRI? If there is a machine invented to in, induce a panic attack, it's an MRI machine. All right. So they, you know, put me on the table. They don't tell you this, but they strap your head down so you can't move your jaw or your forehead. And then now that you get to do all this with a mask on, so I'm, you know, going to suffocate of my own coffee breath. And, um, you know, they pull you in. And then this cacophony of noises starts. And it's like they've assembled, like, what are the 12 most annoying sounds known in the world? We're going to try them all. You know, so at first it's a fire alarm, then it's an atomic energy alarm, then it's clanging sledgehammers, and then it's hubcaps being whipped against a concrete wall. You're just like, oh my gosh. Well, I thought, I, I forget, when I, I, I'm inclined to anxiety and a panic attack, I've had them throughout my life. I forget little things like how to breathe or how to swallow when they start. And so, man, I'm, I'm buzzing into that thing. And I'm thinking, it's all about to start happening. And uh, I thought, you know, maybe this is a good opportunity to practice some centering prayer. But in centering prayer, you, you hold on to a, a word or just a few words. And these were mine as I buzzed into the MRI tunnel. Be still, because that's the last thing they told me, right? Be very still. You can't move. So I'm be still, be still. And you know what I heard after that? Be still and know that I am God. All right? And then, because where's Terry? Terry knows how I am with my letters, right? right? So I thought I need another B word. Be, be still. Uh, behold. Behold the man upon the cross. Right? I'm in a tunnel with annoying noises, but I'm not hanging on a cross. But I know the man who did, and he did it for me, and he did it for you. Behold the man across. Because you can't stop at two B words. You need a third B word. I thought, beloved, beloved. And I'm reminded that I am my beloved. My beloved is mine. And friends, as we enter into a world full of voices, I invite you to, to, to practice this. I hope it doesn't have to happen for you in an MRI tunnel. Maybe it just happens in your car, in your living room. But I invite you to center yourself on prayer and to be still, to behold, loved. Amen? All right. Hallelujah. Hey, what are we doing? Are we singing another song? Okay, let's sing another song. Then I'll come up and pray for us. I heard the gospel today, did you? Amen. Thank you, Matthew. I haven't seen you for a couple of weeks. I was about ready to send out send them out to find you. Stand up, please. Upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord.
Thank you, Cooper. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these folks. I thank you for your church. Would we get out of this building and go be the church by your grace and for your glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.